I'm John Zielinski, author and journalist with over 30 years of professional experience. I have chosen this medium, a series of programs, to present what I'm calling American Genocide. It'll deal with the drug problem in America, in Iowa. It'll deal with a child kidnap network in Ring that it exists in the United States and apparently originates out of Des Moines, Iowa. It'll deal with the farmer and the farm crisis. And what I'm going to do is give you a comparison between what went on in Nazi Germany and what is going on today in the heartland of America. What is happening to America's children in the cities? What is happening to the American farm family in the country? What is happening at every level of American society? If we don't wake up, we will not have any freedom left within a few years. We have a little freedom today. There's going to be the kind of things that will turn your stomach in this program. There's going to be explicit language in this program. There's going to be things that have already made my friends turn and say, let's talk about something else, John. We've heard that enough. I'm making these programs for one reason, to put it down once and for all. There should be at least six half-hour programs in this. They will be made available on half-inch VHS to any community group, to any library, to any social group, to anyone who literally wants to view them. They are important. They are about your life and your future and the life and future of your children. I hope you will bear with me and understand that I am very serious about this. This is America in genocide. America willing to kill its own children. represents is coming to pass in America. A new fascism is rising in America. A new fascism in which our own federal government is a part. They are putting down the Constitution. They are putting down civil rights of individuals. Individual farmers, individual businessmen, individuals in every walk of life are beginning to feel the oppression. In the downtown street a few days ago, I displayed a swastika borrowed from a local antique shop. A man immediately came up and began speaking to us, thinking at first that we were neo-Nazis, and when I said no, I'm merely trying to illustrate the fact that fascism is growing in America, that we have a kind of new neo-Nazism at the University of Iowa, at the state capitol in Des Moines, and he agreed. He said, I escaped from Poland uh, back in the 70s, and it took me three years to get to America. And he now finds that there is what he calls creeping fascism or new Bolshevism in America. Uh, uh, abortion, education, uh, condom distribution in New York. It's, uh, it, it brings down... Uh, society, no, no values, no moral values are collapsed. 
Well, Absolutely. It's a, a neo-Bolshevism, mm -hmm. neo-fascism. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing. He commented that uh, George Bush's new world order was suspiciously like the works of Lenin and so on, Marx and Trotsky, and their then new world order that brought us the Soviet Union. Now, is this what you want for your children? A new world order in which the American family farm is now the collective farm. Uh, it doesn't matter whether that communist organization is corporate communism or whether that organization has the name uh, Soviet this or Soviet that. Corporate communism, the control of the farmland of America by corporate interests amounts to the same thing as the collective farms of the Soviet Union. What is the end result? What do you think is the, this end result of this new world order? What will well, happen finally? I think that... If, if he will I, be successful. All right, I have seen it coming that we are essentially going in to the kind of thing that you had in Russia. Right now, there is a mm -hmm. desire to have the American farmer, the family farmer, take it off the farm and replace it with an industrial farm. Yeah, farmers, with, with farmers, a corporation. You know, farmers yeah. are being made to feel like they're shit. Yeah. That they're not worth anything, that they're, okay. they were never doing it right. And that if they want to work, they should just work on the farm. This is what, they take the farm away from them and say, look, you can keep on staying in your house, you just work for us now. No. And uh, they don't want to do this. Americans have always been independent. They'd rather be poor on their own farm than they would be earning a nice salary and not owning anything. Corporate America has such a hold over the judicial system that when they tell a judge to jump, a judge jumps. There seems to be two standards. Um, if a, a major concern is the plaintiff against a small defendant or private citizen, that there seems to be two standards in the courts for what uh, the procedures uh, entail. And that um, kind of comes out in when we file motions that are let's say, uh, against the plaintiff, which in this case is the Farm Credit Administration, uh, some of those motions have never even been addressed in the courts. They refused to even bring them up for hearing. At one point, we had uh, a motion for default judgment uh, when the Farm Credit System declared that they had paid the receiver and it was in the violations of two court orders. Uh, a receiver is supposed to be a third party, unbiased to either one of the other two parties, in order to manage the incomes of, this, of the uh, lawsuit. When the plaintiff admitted that he played, paid the receiver for his uh, operations and requested that they be paid back in a decree of foreclosure, it showed that they were actually bribing the public official. We, uh, we filed a default, uh, a motion for default, based on the violations of two court orders which directly ordered them to pay it out of the receivership account rather than from the plaintiff's account. Uh, when that wasn't heard at a proper length of time in the district court, we uh, filed a motion for writ of mandamus from the Supreme Court to direct a lower court to, to perform. The Supreme Court also denied it and refused it. So we have some major problems and we have motions that we go into court, we can't get the courts to address our complaints or our, our legal claims that have been proven, which they even admit to. I, I guess this is some of the problems that we're finding in our court system and in our... Uh, yeah. You're saying if you're a corporate entity or you're a government entity and you're important, the court addresses those issues, but if you're an individual against the government or a big corporate entity, you're not getting answers. You're not. That's correct. I think they they ignore what they don't want to address.
judges do what they want. Judges sentence you to jail because they have a friend that wants you in jail. Judges take your business because their friend wants your business. Where is it all going to stop? When are you going to step forward and be counted? When are you going to say, I've had enough? It's time we did something about these lying judges. It's time we did something about these lawyers. I'm going to tell you a joke. What's the difference between a dead lawyer and a dead skunk in the middle of the road? Skid marks before the skunk. Nothing was done at the farm situation in the 30s until, what was there, a judge at Lamar's was uh, taken and a rope was put around his neck and threatened the hanging and then, uh, uh, what, day or two later, a moratorium on bankruptcies was declared. But if that act hadn't taken place, well, it would have been more of the same, more of the same. Thomas Jefferson said the American farmer was the backbone of America. Today, that small, independent American farmer is under siege. He is suddenly an idiot, a bad manager. He is incompetent. He has to have something done about him. He's a troublemaker if he attempts to hold on to land that his family may even have homesteaded more than a hundred years ago. My name's Harold Dunkelberger. I'm uh, from Pilot Mound, Boone County, Iowa. Third generation farmer on my farm. Uh, my grandfather was a <clears throat> in the Civil War from Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania Volunteers. After the war, he came back to Boone County and homesteaded. And uh, my father lived there. I was born and lived all my life there, with the exception of uh, my World War II United States Navy Air Corps experience. Come back after the war and have farmed there until the present time. Uh, two weeks ago, I was finally forced after after battling the farm credit system since 1983 into a out-of-court settlement. Uh, at the present time, I am no longer a landowner. When they uh, targeted me for foreclosure, I, had, I don't uh, acknowledge I didn't have a debt. Uh, I had the 84 crop, which was a very good one, uh, in the bins. Uh, because they targeted me, there was uh, no money. Uh, they disallowed the, uh, the budgeted money. I couldn't pay my inputs. Uh, I had to drop the wife's health insurance. We didn't have money for food. Couldn't pay the light bill or the fuel bill. Uh, the crops were in the bin uh, uh, needing drying with uh, no electricity and no fuel. Uh, they would and did deteriorate fast. There was uh, in the neighborhood $400,000 worth of corn and beans that uh, the, the market value that they let deteriorate because of their uh, eagerness to starve me out. Uh, when they found out that, uh, that along with other threats, that uh, I was to uh, quickly auction two farms that I'd had 100% uh, paid off, uh, that was their demand. Uh, I uh, wouldn't bow down to those demands because there would be terrific uh, tax consequences if I'd had if I would have done it. They knew it, but that's part of their setup is to after they get everything you got, you uh, go the rest of your life indebted to IRS, and uh, <clears throat> so. Uh, when they couldn't kowtow me any other way, why well, they got a, uh, a legal instrument that even the lawyers don't like. It's so severe and so rotten, it's called a replevin. They go to the court and say, hey, 
Dunkelberger hasn't paid his expenses. He's got this grain out there in the farm. He's got this machinery out there in the farm. The grain is worth 300000 The machinery is worth 400000 Judge, sir, let us go out and get him. And, of course, the judge is just happy to do that, so he signs the little thing. And uh, they don't tell you when this is going to happen. So uh, I was uh, at a local town uh, with uh, a friend's truck. Uh, come back to the farm about 10.30, and lo and behold, there was a highway patrol car across the barn driveway. There was a highway patrol car across the house driveway. Uh, there was six sheriff county deputy cars uh, in the yard. There was trucks, uh, loading equipment, uh, men in the uh, yard. Uh, it looked almost like uh, Omaha Beach in World War II with all the attention and of course I could do nothing but stop the truck well I was ordered to because two deputies come out with their shotgun the one had the shotgun the other had the 357 both leveled at me get out of the truck a body search and uh, I got out of the truck and uh, submitted to the body search and uh, the old chin on the deputies was just a quiver and they were just scared to death and they jabbed the old gun right in my rib. They wanted to confront They wanted to cuff me and stuff me. They wanted to see how far they could go. But uh, I knew enough uh, that that wasn't the place being outnumbered about 41. So I uh, submitted to the body search and uh, they looked in the truck and they found an old rusty axe that had been there probably the owner of the truck said he'd carried it in there for 12 years never i don't know what it was for but uh they figured that was a uh, uh vicious attack weapon so uh, they uh finally let the patrol car go ahead so i drove in the yard <clears throat> there was a sheriff down there in full dress uniform of course I went to him to see if they had the proper uh, judge's signature on the uh, replevin order, uh, which they did, and they was already loading up some of the son's machinery that, uh, due to his lawsuit, was exempt from the uh, replevin order. But of course, that didn't stop them with the Gestapo tactics why uh, they had them uh, already loaded. And uh, I said, hey, uh, Sheriff, that's not on there. Sorry, that's not going. And the old uh, farm credit authorities, one of them come up and said, Sheriff, you load that. That's the first that's going to go out of this yard. And I said, hey, wait a minute. David, my son's lawyer, has already made an agreement. It's uh, between the two lawyers. It's agreed upon that his uh, machinery wouldn't be replevined until his case was heard in court. Now, uh, I'm going up and make a telephone call. My God, you're not going up to your house unless my deputies are going with you. So here I go to my house, uh, uh, 357 pulled on each side while I go up to the house, get up to the house, and man, there was aluminum step ladders cement blocks, lawn furniture, what on earth? And here was two dogs, my two uh, farm dogs, incarcerated in the back porch. And I had to move, I said, what in the hell's been going on here? Oh, by the way, we broke in and got your guns. I said, oh, we'll see your search warrant. Don't have to have any search warrant. So I went in, made the telephone call to the lawyer, and uh, and uh, said, "Yeah, uh, most definitely, David's machinery is not to go. It's not an issue." So I went back out, told the sheriff that what the uh, lawyer told me. Farm credit guy said, "Dead gun, God damn it, loaded." Up to the house I went. Up to the house again with the 
deputies on each side with a 357 on each side of me. Finally, the sheriff come. I said, hey, I want you to listen on the other phone, what they say. So he wouldn't go with us through the dogs in the back part. He tap, tap, tap. I said, is that me? And uh, so he came in, and we finally got that resolved that, hey, it didn't go. But uh, uh, they, got, they took the guns. They broke into the house. Uh, they had no uh, claim to go in the house. They had no uh, probable cause, no search warrant. They still own the guns. Uh, later then, a few days later, I uh, got a uh, hearing, had to appear. Uh, the dogs had to appear. They uh, declared them vicious attack dogs. And they declared the guns all automatic assault weapons. Harold Dunkelberger had his house broken into, searched for weapons, and those weapons confiscated without any search warrant, without any due process. Some of what is happening to Dunkelberger now is done without due process, and it is done because he has no one to go to. Not a legislator, not a representative, not a lawyer who will dare challenge the system. And then uh, we've had, <clears throat> over the years, three break-ins by foreign credit. And the reason I say I know it's foreign credit is because it was the... Uh, uh, it was investigated, and it was a professional job of uh, breaking in with the least amount of damage, which if it was a burglary, why they just hammer the door in and gain access, and uh, nothing of value was taken as far what, as... What do you think that was for, or why? They went after, uh, because at that time, my son's suit was hot on the front burner, and uh, they come in, they definitely went for records in the basement left everything alone but records in the basement. Um, two other break-ins, uh, minor harassment tactics. Uh, one time they got a safe, a small uh, 180 pound safe. They carried the whole damn thing out because they couldn't uh, open it. Looking for more evidence to use against me and my upcoming uh, lawsuit against them. Uh, <clears throat> November 30th of this year, uh, I was going to Fort Dodge to a uh, meeting with my professional witness on my lawsuit. Went past the North Place, I called it the Carlson Place. Uh, couldn't believe uh, I'd, I'd rented the uh, ground out because I couldn't farm it because of their vicious UCC uh, uh, that they file on you, that if I'd have farmed it and raised anything, I couldn't have sold it without farm credit's name on the check. I was forced to uh, rent the ground out to a tenant in order to uh, keep going. Anyway, it was his crops up there, and they were in disking them down. And so I went up to my meeting with the uh, uh, professional witness, come back, past my tenant's place, tell him what's going on. Uh, he says, on your way home, uh, when I went past where the uh, disc wasn't in operation, only about a fourth of it had been disc. I seen the tractor and disc right across the road on the neighbor's farmstead. Knowing it wasn't his, it was somebody else's, not knowing whose it was. Uh, so I told my tenant, he says, go back around there, and if they're in the field, give me a call. So I went back around there on the way home. Sure enough, this grillo is in there uh, disking these crops down. And uh, so I give him a call on the telephone, telling him, hey, you're over there right now disking. Well, he says, you go up and stop. Uh, I'll be over as soon as I can. So uh, I had a few things to do, change clothes, got in the pickup, drove up there, went around to the north of the farm past where the tractor had sat earlier that morning looking to see if there was a pickup, some means of identification who the gorilla was out there disking. Wasn't nothing, no sign of nobody, so I drove down in 
through the old building lot that I had uh, previously in years back uh, surveyed off and sold to another individual who wasn't living there but was using the building. Went over by the tractor, stopped him and said, hey, uh, you're trespassing, you best get that thing out of here. And, uh, and he said, Casey Clark told me to do it and I'm going to do it. And uh, I said, you're trespassing, get it out of here. And uh, I uh, kind of reminiscent of the Chinese student in Tiananmen Square in front of that tank. I got in front of the tractor and I said, you're trespassing, best you get out. You get the hell out of the way or I'm going to run over you. So he dropped the clutch and hit me with the duel and knocked me flying and the disc ran over my feet. And about this time the tenant came in from the other end of the field, seeing what was going on, pulled the pickup in front of his tractor to stop it. And got out and this guy came at him with a channel lock pliers. You know, didn't know who he was from Adam, but just the fact that uh, he got in front of the truck and was stopping and he was going <clears> to <throat> part his head with uh, those pliers. So anyway, uh, uh, I was pretty badly injured. Uh, I went, I said, hey, uh, get a hold of that guy, find out who in the heck he is. Uh, I'm going to go to the hospital. So I took off to the hospital. Tenant told me I couldn't have got more than three or four miles down the road. Here come a poli uh, highway patrol car from the north, just a screaming. Missed the corner, went around, went this way. Uh, he said within 15 minutes, uh, there was a highway patrol car and four deputy cars. And we're 23 miles from Boone. And the odds against that happening would be one in 10 million because uh, uh, with my dogs and the previous uh, way they've handled things, if I would be murdered out there, I'd be lucky if I could get a deputy in an hour. They turned this thing clear around. Uh, tenant and I being assaulted, uh, attempted murders, uh, what I called in from the field before I went to uh, the hospital, uh, called it. How bad was your injury? What, uh, what was done? Lucky I had uh, steel-toed work shoes and uh, yeah, I've got bruises, contusions, but the main thing is the uh, post-traumatic stress syndrome and the uh, nightmares of this damn tractor running over me, the depression, the uh, all the other things that's associated with sleeplessness. Uh, uh, but they turned that around. Yeah. Now I got a criminal, along with they immediately filed a civil action. Oh, this guy's in terrible shape. We abused and misused and uh, he's lucky he lived. And uh, so they got damages and punitive damages. And you mean then, against the one who was driving the... No, against the ten at nine. Yeah, yeah they done before, a spin on that. Right, but for, uh, because they said you injured the guy that was driving... Mm -hmm. the, That's the basis of their lawsuit. Right. Yeah, yeah. These kinds of things lead to the question of who is going to be producing our food in future. Is it going to be the farm factory? Is it going to be the corporate farm? Is it going to be the collective farms like it was in Russia? We've already heard now for almost 50 years how those collective farms in Russia were not very efficient at what they did, how food was always short, and so on. I'm saying to you that America had better wake up. The farmer, the man who loves his land, is being put off that land. He's being told, okay, you can come back as a worker, you can keep your house but it is the love of the land and the love of agriculture that has been an important part of America. He listened to his politicians, he listened to his bankers when they told him, plant from row to row, plant everything you can plant in corn. And now what's happening? There's no price in corn, there's no price in hogs, there's no price in cattle. The land that he was told to buy 
and buy and buy at two thousand an acre is now down in some cases to seven hundred dollars an acre he no longer has the equity in his property to be able to hold on to what he had and is it is it his fault is he a poor manager how can that be so when some of these farm families have been generation after generation in the farm biz business he has followed the lead of his co-op he has followed the lead of his government in telling him what to do the government is making a mess of the farmer in america they're going to be putting you and i on the line the food line in future This is where publisher Paul Zimmer works. I have approached Paul Zimmer and other members of the university administration and other members and faculty and asked them to pay attention to what was going on with the American farmer. Mr. Zimmer did not hesitate to publish a soulful book on the plight of the farmer in poetry. He does not hesitate to appear at Prairie Lights Bookstore and read from that soulful collection. But as to doing something to actually help the farmer, you won't find him there. I say that anyone who stays silent in the face of rising fascism is himself a fascist. And it's, eight, and it's legs shivering, and it's back dropped so far, your feet dragged on the ground when you sat on it even if he was the youngest. He'd rent it, touching it on its side all the way down to its tail, and back up to its neck, picking up its feet, squinting into its face, prying open its mouth. Horse it was, after all, a horse, and all he needed was what it was, harnessed to the plow for a couple of afternoons. It says, don't talk to the police about Johnny Gosh. Now, why would the Nambla network say within a few months after the disappearance of Johnny Gosh, don't talk to anybody about it. And later, there's a boy in prison from Nebraska, now his name is Paul Bonacci. Paul Bonacci was one of the children on that network for more than 15 years. That is, he sold his body across the country and across the world. He had met with Johnny Gosh several times over the years and said, yes, Johnny Gosh is a sex slut. Don't ever do that yes. again, mister. Now, mister, I am here to talk no, about what's going go on. Go ahead. You don't ever go come ahead. up behind give me it. and put that shit up behind give me. It. Give me a swing, mister, because you're the one that's betraying this country. 